All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening. This is Dr. McSherry. It is 9.06 p.m. on March 5, 2014. Tonight we're going to be working on uh, exam 11, and it is we're going to be starting on question number one. Um, we did exam 11 back on December 23rd, and uh, we're going to be starting on question one on this exam. I do need a volunteer to read some questions tonight. So, um, Dion, I, I just got your text. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody interested in reading tonight and send me a text? Um, or I can just, I don't like to just keep on taking people off of mute and asking. Um, but I know there's a couple of people here that could possibly be good candidates for reading. Uh, Dr. Sonia Williams, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and try you first and see if you respond. So I'm going to go ahead and take you off of mute and just see. I'll just pay Russian roulette here. Sonia, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, okay, great. Um, do you mind reading tonight a little bit for me? No, that's fine. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so we're on exam 11. You have a copy of exam 11, correct? Yes, I do. Okay, awesome. Great. All right, so we'll move on to question number one. All right, okay. number one. This this test, let me just give you guys a little history on this exam. This exam is a little bit harder than the average exam. It has a lot of, uh, you know, physiology questions and what have you, so we'll see how we do. Okay, go ahead. Okay. A 35-year-old woman has been taking a combination oral contraceptive. You want to switch her to a triphasic therapy. The proposed advantage is A, better contraceptive protection, B, less breakthrough bleeding, C, less metabolic effects of the progestin component, D, less risk of cervical and breast cancer, and E, a lower cost. Um, and I said, I said C, less metabolic effects of the progestin component. Um, I don't believe for A, better contraceptive protection, I think that's incorrect. Less breakthrough bleeding. Um, normally, you usually have a higher dose um, OCP that has estrogen in it, um, and less risk of cervical and breast cancer. I know uh, OCPs are protective for at least breast cancer. In lower cost, I'm not sure if that's valid. So okay. I picked C. Okay, so um, you do have a good point there. Let me just clarify a little bit. Um, what is the difference between triphasic therapy and monophasic therapy? What is the main difference? The main difference is the progesterone. The progesterone is what's altered. Good. Um, okay, good. And why? how is it altered in triphasic therapy? What do they mean by that? Um, it's, the, it's the dosage. So I believe the dosage... Um, does it get higher or does it get lower as you take it? Like saying, you Let's know, see. day one is the first day of your menstrual cycle, obviously. Right. It probably gets higher. Right. And actually, you're absolutely right on that. It does get higher. If you look at the amount of progesterone on the birth control, but it doesn't get lower. It actually gets higher. So what happens is um, they actually do get more breakthrough bleeding on the triphasic therapy because it's trying right. to mimic the normal body's secretion of progesterone. So it actually changes okay. as the cycle gets closer to ovulation. Um, the monophasic okay. therapy is the same amount of progesterone during the course of the month, and of course then there's the week of the pill-free week. Now, let me ask you a question here. Um, what is the name of the estrogen that's normally used in birth control pills? What type of estrogen? Ethanol, is estradiol. Excellent. Very, very good. Ethanol, and, estradiol. Yeah, good, good. And depending on what pill that you use, it depends on what the dosage of mm -hmm. ethanol, estradiol is. But And the progesterone can change with different. Some pills it's norethrodone. Some pills it's levonorgestrel. Mm -hmm. Some pills it's norgestimate. So it depends on what pill you Now, what pill do you prescribe when you're in the clinic seeing patients? Um, usually mononessa. I usually use a monophasic, and um, mononessa or tri trisprintic. I know is covered. Okay. Um, so it's based on their insurance plan. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you do have probably a lot of patients on public assistance. Is that correct? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. When you're when you're in you know a training facility, you usually have to do what the insurances will pay for, and you can't give them an right. expensive birth control pill. So, okay, good. You, you answered that correct. That's good. Okay, I had a question here, and right, and Dr. Jada was right. It was higher. It gets higher as the the weeks go on. Good, excellent. So I'll go and pull this up really quick, and. Um, here it is on the bottom here. It says, the preparations were developed in an effort to reduce the amount of total progestin per cycle without sacrificing conscious efficacy or cycle control. The reduction achieved by beginning a low-dose progestin and increasing it later in cycle, and that's exactly what we said. The lower dose should result in a reduction of the progestin attribute metabolic changes and adverse side effects. So the thing is they, they don't have as many side effects, but they do have more breakthrough bleeding with the, um, right. the triphasic pills. Okay, number two. Okay. On pelvic examination, you notice a right lateral anterior vaginal wall defect. Um, this defect is most likely caused by um, A, defect in pupil coccygis, uh, B, detachment of the endopelvic fascia from the ischial spine, C, detachment of the endopelvic fascia from the paracervical ring, and D, detachment of the pubic cervical fascia from the arcuous tendinous uh, fascial pelvis, and E, disruption of the pubal urethral ligament. This is pretty weak, but I, I think I just went for most common, and I chose D, um, detachment of the pubal cervical fascia from the arcuous tendinous fascia pelvis. Okay, and your answer is D, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. I agree with you 100% on that. So. D is going to be your lateral vaginal wall. In fact, that's going to be a paravaginal defect. And that's when you, usually if you have a defect in the pubic cervical fascia in the midline, that's a cystocele. But if it, when it goes lateral, then it's going to be a paravaginal defect. And those get a little bit hairier on trying to repair those. Um, okay. You've got to be an experienced vaginal surgeon. So, to repair a paravaginal defect involves a suture attachment of the lateral vaginal wall to the arcaneus tendineus fascia pelvis. Um, answer B, I think they're just trying to describe an answer B is going to be an enterocele. That's an enterocele. You may want to write okay. that down. And then C is a cystocele. And then E is um, urethral hypermobility. And then A, I couldn't find anything if there's a defect in the pubic co coccygeus muscle. And that's part of the levator. So. Levator, okay. I couldn't find much on that. Okay, number three. Okay. You're doing great. Um, three, the most common form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia results from a deficiency of which enzyme? A, 17-20-desmolase, B, 17-hydroxyhydroxylase, C, 21-hydroxylase, uh, or D, 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, E, 18-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. Um, so most common, I believe it's a 21 hydroxylase I picked, yes, C, 21 hydroxylase. Good, excellent, mm -hmm. yep. And congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the most common autosomal recessive metabolic disease, and it's estimated to occur as an incorrect one in 10,000. And it's most common in Ashkenazi Jews. Mm -hmm. And alternatively, there is, is deficiencies in, um, oh, my God, that's a really bad typo, in 11 beta hydroxylase activity, and it counts for 5 to 8% of the disease. Mm -hmm. um, so there's 11 beta and then 3 beta all. That's another one that um, you can actually see. So uh, diagnosis, you you have to diagnose a 17 hydroxyprogesterone level, and then that tells you whether or not they have 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, okay, good. So remember, autosomal recessive, um, Ashkenazi Jews, you see that in congenital okay. hyperplasia. How does a baby present? Let's say the baby's born, and, mm. you know, um, this is an Ashkenazi Jew couple. We were counseled about all the different metabolic errors, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, how would a baby present a neonate if you were suspecting it had CAH, full-blown CAH? Um, Ambiguous uh, genitalia? Yeah, there you go. Good job. Ambiguous genitalia. Good. And what would you say to the parents if a baby did have ambiguous genitalia? What would you actually say to the parents? Hmm. <laughs> I guess we could talk to, talk to them about um, karyotyping. 
Um, well, you're just going to say, hey, you know, hey, lady, you know, your baby is kind of weird looking down there. We're going to carry your type and see if it's a boy or a girl. Is there anything gentler you can say that's not as <laughs> abrasive? <laughs> this could happen to you in practice, you know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, okay. I, mm. the, the, the soft way of uh, breaking this <laughs> bad news to your patient is to say to them before you actually, you're probably suspecting it may have CH, but the mm -hmm. best thing to, to say to the mother and the father is that, you know, the baby's genitals haven't fully developed yet. Okay. And uh, we need to do some testing on your infant to see um, what the sex assignment is. I don't know if I would say sex assignment. I mean, that sounds kind of abrasive too, but yeah. we need to do some evaluation on the infant. And, okay. and then you, what you want to do is you want to order the 17 OHP level. And um, what happens if the 17 OHP level is low? Um, mm. I, I don't know. Somebody wants somebody to look it up for me. Um, I think what happens is there's a blockage in the enzyme, and I think it's actually elevated. But um, if it's low, I think that might be okay. Uh, somebody, mm -hmm. won't you look that up for me? Somebody just texted me that. Okay, so we'll go ahead to the next question, number four. Okay. A 22-year-old is in deep transverse arrest in the second stage of labor. The baby's head is noted left oxy, um, occipital transverse position. This scenario is consistent with which anatomic shape of the pelvis? A, android, B, um, anthropoid, C, gynopoid, and D, platypoid. Um, I believe you talked about this yesterday. Um, I picked D, platypoid. I know that A, android, is usually will have the occiput posterior positions more common with that. Um, so which one is occiput posterior? Is it android or anthropoid? Occiput posterior would be android. Are you A. sure about that? The occiput posterior? Yeah. Occiput posterior, yes. Okay, that's incorrect. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> Look it. There's OP in anthropoid. See OP oh, there? Okay. So remember, occiput posterior. Platypeloid is your duck. Right. You know? So remember that it's going to be left occipital. I always remember that the platypeloid pelvis kind of goes like this. Right. And then your um, android, your anthropoid pelvis is kind of the one that goes Go like this kind of. And then okay. the android is this one here. So, yeah, you have OP is anthropoid, and that's the one you see occiput posterior presentation. The gynecoid is the normal pelvis, and it's that's normal. the one that kind of looks like, you know, normal. I mean, I don't know if I'm doing it right. Yeah, that's about right. Right. Okay. Okay. So remember yep. your – oh, I'm sorry. That's not it. It's Yeah, no, no, this is the male, right? Mm -hmm. This is an posterior, and this is anterior. And then this is your AP with this one, mm -hmm. and then this is the heart-shaped. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. You got that? Yep. Okay. And then last time, let's see if you remember. What are the mm -hmm. different measurements of the pelvis? There is the three different measurements of the pelvis. Remember the top of the pubic bone? And this yes. is the sacrum, and then we measure yeah. these three measurements here. Yeah, the so, yeah. Mm -hmm. so you have, you know, your inlet, your mid-level, and your outlet. So the inlet will be measured by um, your diagonal conjugate, which is your um, uh, obstetric conjugate minus your um, obstetric minus your oh, oh you're a mess oh right gosh now. wait a minute I know it's diagonal conjugates which you measure superior yeah um oh occipital is oh obstetrical oh true so it's obstetrical minus true conjugate will give you a diagonal conjugate and that's your inferior um, aspect of your pubic symphysis to the sacrum and then and that's your in your inlet. Your mid-level would be your transverse, which is your ischial spine, um, the measure between there, and then your outlet would be your uh, ischial tuberosity. Okay, so let me just clarify that a little bit for you. So remember, it's true, Todd, true, obstetrical, and diagonal conjugate. And the one that we measure is the diagonal, and the average right. measurement on that is going to be about 12. 12, yeah. 12, yeah. So if you got the measurement on that, you just minus uh, 1.5, 
And okay. if you can get this measurement, then it'll mm -hmm. give you your obstetrical conjugate. And a normal obstetrical conjugate on a, on a gynecoid pelvis is 10.5, and that's normal. And that's what you need to get a baby's head to come through. Okay. So what's the 1.5? The 1.5 is, is a constant. It's a constant number. Yeah. There. So whatever your measurement is, on mm -hmm. your diagonal, and that's the one you can measure by doing a pelvic exam. You put your fingers in the vagina. You try mm -hmm. to get your middle finger to the sacral palmitory. You measure all the way to your thumb where it hits the pubic bone, and mm -hmm. you've got 12 centimeters. If it's larger than that, that's even better. But, right. I mean, that's what you want. But, I mean, on average, it's about, it should be about a 12. If it's any smaller than 10.5, then you know you got a problem. you got an issue. Okay. you got a problem with the pelvis there. All right. Let's move on to the next question. And we are number five. Okay, um, yeah, this one. 20-year-old um, with gestational diabetes, currently on 2,000 kilocalorie diet. Her glucose uh, diary documents fasting values in the 110 and a two-hour postprandial of 125. Uh, the next best step in her management is A, continue present management, B, decrease daily caloric intake, C, decrease proportion of fat in the diet, uh, D, initiate insulin therapy, and E, decrease proportion of complex carbohydrates in diet. So initially, I mean, I, I think that's wrong. Five, I put B, decrease daily caloric intake, but I don't think that's correct. Okay, um, so you don't want to increase your caloric intake. That's not the right thing to do. So um, she's currently on 2,000 kilograms. That's probably appropriate for her weight. I think mean, that yeah. sounds about right. Her glucose diary documents fasting values in the 110. What should her fasting be? Sorry, what should her fasting actually be? I mean, less than 90, so greater than Less than, than 90, 60, 95, 90. depending on what you're using at your, mm -hmm. at your institution, okay? And what do you want your two-hour postprandial to be? Less than one. Less than 120. No, you less don't. She's a little high. Yeah. So um, the next best step in her management. Now, personally, what I would do is start this lady on metformin. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mess around with her calories. Okay. You know, um, so what I, I would I just, do, they don't have metformin here as a choice, so what's the next best um, option? For PO, you can do like glyburide. You can start glyburide. Okay, well, know. not glyburide, but that's not a choice here, so what's the next step you can um, do? Um, you would, uh, besides starting insulin? Well, well, you can't, yeah, well, that's what you'd have to do. Yeah. Because start, you don't want to, you're right, you don't want to start insulin. Putting her on a hypoglycemic agent would probably be the best Take option. Her. Glyburide mm -hmm. is the drug, so you can use metformin. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, glyburide is where all the studies were done. But, yeah. I mean, if glyburide is not available, then you want to just initiate insulin therapy. I'm going to go back to the next fast past slide because um, I didn't pull up the answer here. So the answer is oh. um, D. Okay. And there we go. I just wanted to make sure everybody saw that. All right. And you guys should have a copy of that on your notes. And if you don't have the, this test, then send me an email and get it out to you. Okay, so definitely initiate insulin therapy. Now, they're saying values, not one value. Remember, you have right. to have 50% of them abnormal in order to initiate something. So her documents yeah. fasting values in the 110, the next best step, and you want to initiate insulin therapy because her diet's just not doing it for her. Right. You don't want right. to mess around with their calories. Okay, number six. Okay. Um, six, a 27 year old is being treated for endometriosis with um, luprolide acetate, which is Lupron. Uh, which of the following is the most likely reason for add back therapy? Um, yeah. I was thinking about what the patient would be complaining about. So um, I chose A, but I'm not sure if that's right. Half flashes. Um, B, preservation of bone density is probably the correct answer. Uh, okay, so C, what is the right answer then? Um, B, preservation right. okay. of bone density. Why, why would you say that? I'm going to pick A, but I know B is the right answer. Who in the heck says that? Preservation of bone density? No one. No, 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 no. I'm saying well, you, you, oh. you just, you just double-guessed yourself. You said, I'm going to pick A, but B is probably the right answer. So yeah, why don't you pick was... B then, you silly goose? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, don't do that. See, now yeah. you, see, you're, you're second-guessing yourself. You actually know the right – you guys all are really smart. You know that. You actually know the right answer, but you're actually talking yourself out of it. And that's, it, yeah. 
That was my problem, too, when I took this exam. I actually knew the right answer, but I would say, well, you know, B is probably the right answer, but I'm going to pick A. I mean, don't do that. <laughs> if you know B is the right answer, pick it, damn it. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and you're right. It's preservation of bone density. Yeah, you give these patients Lupron, you put them in a medical menopause, and then their bones are going to suffer. Right. So of particular concern. Um, right. is the effect of hypoestrogenic state on bone, bone mineral density. Evidence indicates there are decreases in the spine hip moment at three and six months of GnRH agonist therapy. You don't want to put them on more than, you can put them on for a year, but you need to give them right. head back therapy if they're doing well. Right. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. And you want to give, um, extend their pain relief, but also the key here is the bone density and you want to, you know, preserve their bones. And the answer is going to be B. Okay. Okay, that's more important right. than extended pain relief. Okay, number seven. Right. Okay. Uh, seven. When using the chemo agent, iphosphamide, uh, the urine epithelium is protected against direct toxic effects by the use of which medication? A, dexamethasone, B, epitoin, or epitin alpha, C, mercaptopurine, D, mesna, E, oxybutyn chloride. Um, Phosphamide. I know it's similar to cyclophosphamide. Um, it's an acylating agent. Um, I chose I chose D Mesna. I'm not sure that's right. Oh, don't yeah, do D that. Don't D? say I, that. I'm not sure that's right. When well, it is the right answer. Oh, okay. I'm I'm sure it's right. It is D. <laughs> I, you know what? I bet your I bet your attendings that you work with you do that. I do that. You do that. This is the second time you did that to me tonight, and we've only okay. been talking okay. for not even a half an hour. <laughs> Don't do that anymore. Stop it. Okay. You know the right answer. Come on. You're right. It is Mesna. Absolutely. Now, what is oxybutyn and chloride? Let's let's see what you know here. Oxybutyn chloride. Who is that? That what is a. Uh, hmm. You know it. It's a. It's a, it's a what? Uh, yeah. uh, it's for uh, oh. your urged incontinence. There you go. What, what drug class oh, is that? God. Oh. It was it starts with a D. It's Ditropan. Detrol. Oh, yeah. okay. Detrol, Detrol. Or Ditropan or whatever. Detrol, yeah. But what class of drug it is a starts with an A. Yeah, there you go. See you 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 see you know the answer. Anticholinergic, good. Um Mesna, okay. Let's go with uh Epipoetin Alpha. What is that stuff for? Oh, uh, that's the uh, I think it's like a oh, so if you have a low white count. So it's probably a, a um, increases your um, leukocytes or enter. Okay. How about so mecaptopurine? Yeah. What's mecaptopurine for? <sighs> mecaptopurine, mecaptopurine. You've heard of it before, haven't you? Mm-hmm, yeah. Uh, Okay, epipoetin alpha or... is for erythropoiesis, stimulating agent. Erythropoiesis. Okay. That's for patients that have on, are on dialysis, they give them epipoetin. Yeah, Remember? Okay. And right. then metacaptopurine, yeah. I wouldn't expect you to know that unless you were like, you know, um, really, 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 really into internal medicine. But it's a, it's a tumor necrosis factor blocker. It's for acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It's also used for okay. disease. Okay. Okay. I was, I was yeah. pushing you a little bit on that. So. Again, um, MESNA is used to reduce the incidence of drug-induced hem hemorrhagic cystitis. And I'm sure you did your oncology rotation. You prescribed that, didn't you? Yeah. You probably wrote the orders for it half the time. You didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number eight. <laughs> um, an 18-year-old G1 P0 presents with vaginal bleeding. Her ser serum beta ECG is 80,000. Um, pelvic ultrasound shows a snowstorm pattern. Um, the preferred approach to evacuating the uterus is a IV uh, methotrexate, B, IV oxytocin, C, sharp curatage, D, suction curatage, um, and E, prostaglandin uh, vaginal. Um, I chose, you want to do a D and C, but you want to be careful not to use a sharp curatage, so I chose D, suction curatage. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, and D's you're absolutely answer. right. Good. Excellent. Excellent. So remember, the most common symptom of a molar pregnancy is going to be vaginal bleeding. Mm -hmm. okay? Okay. And then other signs and symptoms include in uterine enlargement, size greater than dates. And I'm sure everybody in this room or when I the most time career, whether you're a resident and you see at least from my residents, they were fine to them. We had so many molar pregnancies, it was crazy. Okay, so absent fetal heart tones, they get cystic enlargement. 
of uh, the ovaries, and what is that called mm -hmm. when they have cystic ovaries? What is that called? I know, like, uh, it's their theca... Uh, theca what? Cyst. Theca luteal cyst. Theca luteal cyst. Good. Yeah. good, good, good. Hyperemesis gravidarum. They have abnormally high HCG levels for their gestational mm -hmm. age. The molar uh, tissue is identified by looking like mixogenic. It's like a snowstorm pattern. That's what it says up here. And then we treat them. Um, we give them oxytocin. We start doing a suction curatage, and then we give them mm -hmm. oxytocin. So why we're evacuating? Because you don't want um, them to hemorrhage on you. Right. So, um, and they increase blood loss. So and it's usually performed under general anesthesia and so on. Okay. And then how long do you usually follow their betas for? How often do you follow their beta HCG for? Okay, so initially you would follow weekly. There you go, and, good. Yeah, and you'll follow them up to a year. So you do weekly, and then I think when she gets you um, an appropriate amount, I think it's like less than five, you start Q3 months and six months, um, and during that time you have them on some type of contraceptive. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So you want to follow them for up to over a year, and you want to make sure they're on some good contraceptive because you, when they're when you're mm -hmm. following the betas going down and they get pregnant, that becomes a big mess because you're not sure right. if it's a recurrence of the mole or persistent gestational trophy or gestational trophoblastic neoplasia or mm -hmm. if they're truly pregnant. I mean, it can be a big mess. So right. these patients, you have to watch them like a hawk. You have to put them right. on medication. You have to put them on give them Depo-Provera. Or you stick a, uh, I don't know if you can, I, you can't use a leave on a restaurant IUD, but you could probably use some kind of contraceptive implant, and I think that would be your best bet. Right. Okay. okay. All right, number nine. Okay. On post update number five, following abdominal surgery, a 65-year-old with diabetes presents with a temperature of 100.4. The skin around the wound is reddish purple with um, blue eye and has brownish discharge. The most effective management is A, extensive surgical debridement, B, hyperbaric therapy, C, incision and drain, D, IV antibiotics, E, vacuum assisted wound closure. So I'm thinking of like something like clostridium with the blue eye, so something more extensive and emergent. So I chose A, um, extensive surgical debridement. And what does this lady have? Uh, class, um, necrotizing intercolitis. Necrotizing right? what? Necrotizing, necrotizing intercolitis. Enterocolitis? What are you talking about? No, that's the stomach. Wait a minute. <laughs> necrotizing <laughs> fasciitis. Necrotizing there fasciitis. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the neck is with the babies. You were close. But right. That's just right. a, that's a smaller <laughs> patient. Okay. All right, and I'll pull this up real quick here. Necrotizing fasciitis, necrosis around the wound, superficial fascia, and subcutaneous tissue. Peripheral undermined normal skin. Patient suffers from pain. Late in the have you ever seen the? Have you ever seen this before? No, I haven't. Either have I. I have never seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have never seen it. If any of you guys have ever seen it, just text me. I like to see how many people have seen this before. Okay, number ten. Okay, ten. A 34-year-old with bilateral spontaneous breast discharge, beta ACG is less than 5, prolactin is 50, and TSH is 23. The hormone responsible for the elevated prolactin is A, serotonin, B, thyroid-releasing hormone, C, thyroid-stimulating hormone, D, thyroxin, E, vasopressin. So I chose B, thyroid-releasing hormone. Good. Excellent. You've done this test before, haven't you? No, I haven't. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Actually, I was good. Gonna, yeah, I didn't, no, I haven't done this. Good, good, you're yet. doing good. Okay, so TRH, thyroid-releasing hormone, also stimulates prolactin secretion by the pituitary. The smaller doses of TRH that are capable of producing increase in TSH also increases prolactin levels, indicating a physiological role for TRH in the control of prolactin secretion. So, mm -hmm. however, it is in, except for hypothyroidism, normal physiological changes as well as abnormal prolactin secretion can be understood in terms of dopaminergic inhibitory control and TRH need not to be considered. So, again, TRH is involved in elevated mm -hmm. prolactin. Good. Number, that's good. I'm impressed on that. Good. Number 11. Um, which of the following has been reported as a cause of death after uterine artery embolization? A, hemorrhage, B, myocardial infarction, C, pulmonary embolism, D, septicemia, and E, respiratory arrest. I know it's not B, 
Mm. You know, I, I was between A and D and um, septicemia or hemorrhage. What is the most common? I'm going to say, I mean, pick one. Hemorrhage probably. One. Okay, D. Okay, let's see if you're right. You're right. Good. Oh, See? Oh, that was a good. Good. Okay. So, yeah, you just talk yourself through it. So, remember, UAE, they usually die either as a result of a PE or um, septicemia, usually not from hemorrhage, because usually okay. with uterine embolization, they're embolizing the vessels and they're putting something in to stop the bleeding. Right. But they usually mm -hmm. don't hemorrhage, unless, of course, if you lacerate a vessel. But usually, um, the, when I've read, went into this and read about it, it's usually as a result of some kind of septic process or PE. But septic okay. semia is more commonly seen. So okay, okay, good. And laparoscopic myomectomy. Here we go. The other hand, the most serious complications of laparoscopic myomectomy were hemorrhage. Hmm. Okay. And then 68 post-operative hematoma, 48 bowel injury, and emergency hysterectomy. They can get pretty crazy. Okay, number 12. 12. A 36-year-old with a three-month history of milky discharge from the nipples. Pregnancy test is negative, um, which is the least likely cause. Um, phenothiazines, B, stimulation, C, prolactinemia, oh, prolactinoma, D, breast cancer, and E, hypothyroidism. The least likely cause, and 12, I know it's not phenothiazine that could cause it, so that's not one. Stimulation could, prolact prolactinoma could, so it's between D and E, and mm, breast cancer, nipple discharge from breast cancer, I'm thinking milky discharge. Uh, Pick one. I'm going to go, okay, hypoth well, hypothyroid. Pick one. That, I never heard that. Okay, uh, uh, E. That's not it, is it? <laughs> Why are you doing that? What's oh, the right dude. answer? Come on. I don't know. Okay, so what is the What, what is your brain one? telling you to pick? It's D, breast cancer. There you go. See, you knew the right answer. Yeah. Why do you do it's that? Boy, you you are notorious for this is like the fourth time you've done that. Okay, stop it. Okay. Don't do that anymore. Okay, I'm stop it. <laughs> stop it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So remember, breast cancer. Read the question again. Three month Mickey from the nipples, not nipple. Right. Nipple. Okay. So it's bilateral. bilateral. So breast mm -hmm. cancer is going to probably cause a bloody nipple discharge unilaterally. Right. Okay. So you get a bad case of hypothyroidism. It, remember, it can cause. TRH right. and then prolactin and then the whole nine yards right. the prolactin and they get nipple discharge. So physiologic, some of the causes, preg pregnancy, breastfeeding, nipple stim, stress, exercise, sexual intercourse, sleep. Sleep? That's a little weird. Okay. <laughs> pituitary disease, prolactinomas, non-secreting pituitary adenomas, and so on. You can read these on your own. Then your, your uh, antipsychotic drugs like your phenothiazine, even your SSRIs can cause it. Uh, craniopharyngiomas and so on, and there's all weird stuff here, and then peripheral neural stimulation, breast nipple, and we just talked about that. So okay. breast cancer won't cause you, so you bloody nipple discharge. Okay, number 13. Right. Okay. A 71-year-old woman with ovarian cancer has an elevating serum creatinine level after an extensive debulking procedure with large blood loss and severe hypotension. Um, the most likely cause of cellular cast in her urine is A, acute tubular necrosis, B, interstitial nephritis, C, tumor lysis syndrome, D, unilateral ureal obstruction, E, UTI. So this is ovarian cancer, post-surgery, most likely it's an acute event. So I chose um, A, acute tubular necrosis. And with the, yeah, and cellular cast too is another, um, is, is another clue. Okay, so your answer is? A. Okay, good, you're right. Your mm -hmm. ATN causes it, exactly. And ATN is due to a decreased renal blood flow, and that's as a result of hemorrhage. And then once okay. they get decreased renal blood flow, it's a pre-renal azotemia, they can get ATN. Their kidneys can shut down. Interstitial mm -hmm. nephritis is due to medications like NSAIDs. Also, bacterial mm -hmm. viral infections can cause it. They have casts in hematuria. Unilateral ureteral obstruction. I mean, that's, that's usually on one side as a result of a surgical problem. Pain and fever is likely after the surgery. And then tumor lysis syndrome occurs usually after chemotherapy. 
and um, they can have um, probably cast in their urine too. But that's not, but the patient's like this patient's like getting chemo. They're asking, right. they're talking that she had a debulking procedure, so mm -hmm. a large blood loss. That's the key right there, and severe right. hypotension. And we know UTI. That's common sense. But right. It's not like a picture of a UTI. Okay, number fourteen. An abnormal result from a Doppler study of the umbilical artery can be associated with which fetal condition? A, aneuploidy, B, gastroschisis, C, macrostomia, D, parvovirus, B19 infection, E, RH, ice immunization. So I know Doppler studies have to do, you do that normally if there's a suspicion of IUGR. So I, most commonly, I think of, yeah, aneuploidy, so I pick A, 14 is A. Okay, why did you pick A? Um, well, you, you only do um, Dopplers if you're suspicious of an IUGR. Right. Um, so if there's an employee there, it could be Turner's, it could be a number of things, a chromosome abnormality. So, um, well, wh why would why would you want to do Dopplers if it was a chromosome abnormality? Hmm. I mean, because those babies yeah. are at risk for intrauterine growth restriction. They usually don't grow right. Right. So okay. your Downs babies, uh, right. Edwards, Pateau, uh, all those weird chromosomal trisomy 18, which is Edwards, 13 is Pateau, trisomy 21, monosomy X, which is Turner's, any aneuploidy can cause a baby not to grow appropriate and so gastroschisis those babies usually normally grow fine they just have a their their um, abdominal wall doesn't close right so they have right where is the defect with gastroschisis oh in reference to the umbilical cord um hmm. is it in the middle to the right to the left is it anterior to the cord is it superior to the cord is it inferior is it above the pubic bone uh, Where's the defect? I know there's a membrane. It's, uh, um, I don't know. I don't know that one. Okay. I really so don't. So gastroschisis but... is the cord is going to be to the left of the defect, or gastroschisis, the defect is to the right of the cord. Okay. Gastroschisis defects yeah. to the right of the cord. Yeah, okay. or the cord is to the left of the defect. I can really screw you up. Okay. Here, so here's your baby. Okay. Okay. These are supposed. This looks like a frog, but it's really supposed to be a baby. <laughs> Look at the tadpole, for crying out loud. Okay, now it's got a weird abdomen here. Let's fix it. Okay, I'm sorry. I had my problem with my mouse here. Okay, so here's the here's the belly button. Okay. All right? And this is the right side of the kid, and this is the left side of the kid. And just say these are the arms and the fingers. <laughs> this is the frog baby. <laughs> the frog baby. All right, here's the umbilical cord. Okay. <laughs> Don't laugh at my pictures. Okay, so here's the defect will be here. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the cord is to the left. Here's the cord. Here's the cord. Okay. Okay. The cord is to the left of the defect. The defect is to the right of the cord. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the, the gastroschisis has no membrane, correct? And that's correct. The right. umphalocele, the umphalocele is in the middle of the frog baby. Mm -hmm. This is where the umphalocele would be in the middle. Okay. Okay. And then yeah. remember the umphalocele is associated with aneuploidy. And also, it has a, a membrane covering, and that one is probably the it's the it's the bad one. Right. You don't want the baby to have a phallocele. You'd rather have mm -hmm. your baby have gastroschisis. Gastroschisis, right? exactly. Okay. Now, macrosomia. Usually, these babies don't need Doppler studies because I mean, Doppler studies is because why? Because the umbilical cord is not bringing enough blood to the baby because there's some kind of problem. Either it's right. calcified or there's some kind of problem that the baby's not getting enough blood. Parvovirus B19 infection causes a high drops picture with fetal right. anemia. So you wouldn't do a umbilical artery doppler. You would do a middle cerebral Cerebral artery doppler. Artery. Mm -hmm. Same thing with RH ice immunization. That's an anemia picture and you do MCAs for that. Right. right? Okay. MCAs. Yep. All right. So we got it. So emphalocele midline, gastroschisis is to the right, right of the umbilical cord, or the cord is to the left of the defect. I've seen it written okay. both ways on the exam. And gastroschisis is the good one, and the babies grow okay. okay. All right, let's get rid of our pictures, erase all drawings, and get back to my mouse. All right, okay. number 15. 
Uh, which of the following is least likely a, pre a presenting sign or symptom of a molar gestation? Least likely. So all of these are going to be the most likely. Okay. A, abnormal bleeding. B, size greater than dates. C, hyperemesis. D, hypertension. E, cystic enlargement of the ovaries. Um, okay. That will, abnormal bleeding, you'll see that. Definitely size greater than dates. Hyperemesis, you'll see. Uh, cystic enlargement of the ovaries, that can happen. Uh, so the least likely is going to be D. 15 is D. Okay, so least likely a presenting sign or a symptom, right. and I think I may have to I have to agree with you on that one. Let's see if you're right. Good, exactly. Yeah. So most common symptom we just covered it a little bit earlier. It's an abnormal bleeding. Other signs of symptoms that include uterine enlargement greater than expected for gestational and absent fetal heart tone, cystic enlargement of the ovaries, which is the colloidian cysts. Mm -hmm. Hyperemesis, grab an arm, and an abnormally high level of HCG. And then we're going down here. It says pregnancy induced hypertension, the first half of pregnancy, although uncommon. Right. Common, which is least likely. It's suggestive of a ball. Good. Okay, 16. Okay. Uh, which of the following types of pneumonia will have the highest mortality in the pregnant patient? A, streptococcus pneumonia. B, influenza. A, C, varicella. D, klebsiella and E, uh, E. coli. Um, 16, I picked, mm, I picked E. Highest mortality, you said E as an egg? Yeah. You sure about that? Yeah, no, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay, actually the answer is going to be C, varicella pneumonia. Oh, it was varicella. Yeah, okay. remember varicella, chicken pox it's pneumonia? The worst thing to have. 30%, 30% of them that can actually die. Not okay. morbidity, mortality. Increased risk of developing pneumonia with primary varicella infection during pregnancy, increased in the third trimester and in smokers. Most bacterial pneumonia is due to strep. Most mm -hmm. of these patients are smokers, and the pneumonia due to influenza has been reported. But E. coli is very uncommon to see pneumonia of E. coli. Usually that okay. you see sepsis with E. coli. Yeah. Okay, that's 17. What I was All right, 17. Okay, 17. A 20-year-old presents with a history of chronic pelvic pain. A laparoscopy shows no pathology, and the pain does not appear to be related to her menstrual cycles. The most likely etiology of her pain is a history of a abnormal cervical cytology, B, abortion, C, bipolar disorder, D, chlamydia, and E, sexual abuse. Um, I chose E, sexual abuse. Okay, and I agree with that. That's good. Yeah, exactly. That's all that really makes sense. So most published mm -hmm. evidence suggests that a significant association of physical and sexual abuse and various chronic pain disorders. Studies found that 40 to 50 percent of women with chronic pain have a history of some kind of abuse. So remember, right. if you have that patient that keeps on coming back to the clinic or coming back to your office, right, and she has pain, 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 wanting narcotics, you you need to dig a little bit deeper to see what's right. going on with this girl. She may have some kind of abuse situation going on at home. That's why she keeps coming back to the doctor, number 18. Okay. Which of the following would be appropriate for a patient with pain from suspected endometriosis who has failed initial therapy? A, referral for psychiatric evaluation. B, uh, a total abdominal hysterectomy. C, uterosacral nerve ablation. Um, D, lap laparoscopy to confirm presence of endometriosis. And E, repeat dose of GnRH agonist. And... 18, I chose D, laparoscopy to confirm the presence of endometriosis. Okay, and let's see if you're right. Yeah, good job, excellent. So if initial therapy fails in patients with suspected endo, a diagnostic scope is to confirm the presence of endo may be offered. Alternatively, mm -hmm. you can give them pure treatment with another suppressive medication be offered. But especially if you're with a teenager or a younger patient, right. Um, you want to go ahead and maybe do a scope on them. And this is when it's absolutely considered okay to, to just throw in a scope and do it after you treat them. Okay, number 19. Okay. Um, a 68-year-old postmenopausal woman has, has had five urinary tract infections in the past three years. To reduce the risk of future urinary tract infections, the best medication to prescribe is A, estradiol acetate, B, um, I'm a premen, I, hydrochloride, oxybutyrene chloride, uh, rifloxine, hydroxychloride, and tolotiridine uh, tartrate versus destrol. Um, she's postmenopausal and she's 68. 
Mm, don't want to give her estrogen. Uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, B. Uh, D, you don't want to give either. Um, 19, I think it shows, um, so A, I'm eliminating. Um, I'm also eliminating D. I know that's improved for Evesta, that's for like postmenopausal dyspareunia mm -hmm. um, or os in osteoporosis. Uh, Detrol, that's for your urgent content. I think B, 19 is B. Okay, impamine hydrochloride is tough enough to tricyclic antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And what they're trying to get here is that this postmenopausal woman had five years. She probably has atrophy, atrophy. Right. So you want to give her estradiol. You want to give her estradiol. And that's what that's going to do is that it's going to increase the amount of receptors, and then they won't get as many because they think the atrophy is probably leading to her um, symptoms okay. or her urinary tract infection. So it, Improved symptoms associated with atrophy, it may decrease yeah. the risk of recurrent UTI, it may decrease. Okay. I don't so have the a story here, it. but this came out, I, mean, I, have, I need to put the text, but, but it actually is Comprehensive Gynecology 6th Edition, that's what I can Okay. Okay. So the estradiol is a cream, right? Yep. That would be more... Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Or you can even use oral, you can use oral too. You can use oral, yeah, okay. Absolutely. But of course, if, she's had, if she had, doesn't have a uterus, you can just do plain estradiol. Right. Um, if she has a uterus, you can do estrogen and progesterone. You have to give her some mm -hmm. kind of withdrawal bleed. Okay, number 20. Okay. Which of the following is the least likely laboratory test a physician would order on a patient who is suspected to have von Willebrand's disease? Okay, so least likely. So all these tests you would order. Uh, von Willebrand, a, von Willebrand um, Ristocetin cofactor activity. B, von Willebrand factor antigen. C, factor 8. D, bleeding time, um, E, P, T, and P, T, T. Um, okay. Um, I chose bleeding time, I think, is, would really be effective. So D, 20 is D. Yeah, and you're right on that. Good. Now, let me ask you another question. If you mm -hmm. do a P, T, or P, T, T on this patient, which mm -hmm. one's going to be prolonged? Is it P, T, or the P, T, T? The P, T, T. There you go. The good yeah. Good, 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 good. Okay, excellent. So it says laboratory testing. Now, there is a new practice, there is a new committee opinion that was published. Can somebody text that to me, the newest one? Um, I, I can change the source on this. I'm going to be working on this test file this weekend to update some of the sources. We're, we're going to Jersey Shore this weekend. So, Okay, oh. number 21. Okay. A 45-year-old a presents with third with a third episode of Bartholin's gland cyst this year, what is the correct management? A, excision of the gland, B, antibiotic therapy, C, incision and drainage of the cyst, D, biopsy of cyst wall, and E, warm soaks. So E is not the answer. D, very rare to get Bartholin's gland uh, uh, cancer, so antibiotic therapy, no. So it's between A and C, and she presents A and C. Um, isn't it kind of difficult to actually excise the gland? Well, remember, so she's 45. She's 40, 45, so she's okay. had the third episode. So you, you need to do something with this patient, whether, I don't know if I would just IND it. I may do a little bit more of an aggressive management because she's over and 40. Yeah, so then it's probably A. Okay, so you're going to say excision of the gland. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm tossed up. Now, I haven't taken this test in a while, so I'm tossed up between A and C. A and, a and C. Excision okay. and drainage, but I don't even think that's right. I think A and D would be I was thinking answer. of, yeah. A and D, mm -hmm. biopsy of the wall. Let's see what we got here. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I actually yeah. want to fight with this one. I think the better answer is probably it's D. D. Yeah. But um, if anybody disagrees with me on this one, I'll have to look this one back up again. Okay, so you're worried about a malignancy over the age of 40, barthenolectomy, gland incision, if recursed repeatedly, or a massive cyst or mocular, multilocular cyst, Williams first edition, and then they go in here and say um, you're worried about adenocarcinomas. Right. And alternative women over 40, um, it's drainage of the cyst and biopsy of suspicion. Cyst wall um, adequately excludes malignancy. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Somebody said our oncology recommends removal. I will look for other sources. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop here, and I want to thank you very much, Dr. Sonia, for reading these for me tonight. I really appreciate it. No problem. You're learning a lot by doing this, and the more you verbalize, yes. the more you learn. So. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make some announcements. Um, we are going to be in um, Los Angeles on the 15th and 16th at University of Southern California. Um, if you live in Southern California and you want to come to USC and come to that review course with the residents, you're more than welcome. I can take two extra people if you want to come, but you need to let me know immediately because I need to send notebooks out um, with um, uh, with Wilma does a shipment with all the brand new notebooks. So um, please send me an email if you're interested in going. There will be a charge to go. It's um, if you are in a some kind of uh, t uh, package where you've paid for a course already and you want to come to an earlier course and you want to come to USC, you're more than welcome. It's only two days, guys, and we're going to blow through the material really fast. Um, on the 22nd and 23rd of March, um, I'm going to be in. Um, at, at St. Barnabas Medical Center in New Jersey. And if you are interested in coming there, I don't think they mind if another two people came. Um, you can come with me. You're more than welcome to come with me. Um, again, you got to let me know immediately if you are interested in coming to that program. Um, you can just meet me in the parking lot and come in with me. Um, I know another person that's here is going to be coming also to help out with the test file and assisting me on that. On the 29th and 30th, we're going to be at University of Puerto Rico. So if you want to come to Puerto Rico for the weekend, I can take two people for that course, too. We're going to be at San Juan um, City Hospital. So if you're interested in coming to Puerto Rico for the weekend and you can get that weekend off, you're more than welcome. So um, the dates for USC, I'll, I'll read them out again. The 15th and 16th is USC, 22nd and 23rd, St. Barnabas in Livingston, New Jersey, and the 29th and 30th um, University, uh, San Juan City Hospital. I don't think it's University of Puerto Rico, but it's San I can give you more details. You can send me an email. I'll give you more in details. And we are staying at the Conrad, I think it's the Hilton. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of hotels available, but it's a little. if you live in Miami, it may be something that you want to consider going to if, you, if you're living in Atlanta. It's a direct flight from Atlanta. Okay, uh, send me an email if you're interested. Uh, this is Dr. McSherry concluding uh, Dr. Wall's written review. It's 9.59 p.m. on March of 2014. Uh, send me an email if you're interested in any of those courses. And again, I'll be at Jersey Shore this weekend, and Shelly is going to be coming with me. Thank you, Shelly, for assisting me this weekend. Take care, have a good night, and we'll see you all tomorrow, and we'll be starting on exam 4 OB, question number 43. Take care, have a good night. Thank you all for being here.